Uh, thanks to everyone who's come uh, this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are, uh, to see this talk about this particular book. Uh, I have the privilege of talking about it because I'm the editor, but actually the real stars are the people who wrote the papers in it, but I'll go through them all individually. I also wanted to thank the International Institute for Asian Studies um, because they're the uh, reason the book came into being, particularly Paul van der Velde, who's in charge of the series of these publications. Marilyn van Dijk, who was fabulous helping the whole um, organization of it, but also uh, with editorial input. Paul Rabay, who's really been my contact man for all of these and for organizing the events which have led to these publications, and to Amsterdam University Press, especially Saskia Healing and Jap Fagenaar. Very pleasant, professional, enthusiastic people to work with, um, uh, because we've done a number of books together, including uh, this book and the, its predecessor. The peer reviewers' comments were very helpful. That's always a kind of baptism by fire, but it's always a good way of making sure that when the book comes out, it's re really as good as it possibly can be. <clears throat> and of course, the contributors themselves. It came about because um, for many years, I was actually a, a research fellow at Leiden, at, at IAS Leiden, and I organized a number of events on these issues of citizenship. And the first group were quite theoretical, and the second group were more uh, practical. So I split them into two books, uh, and it's the contemporary practices of these practical aspects of citizenship that we'll be looking at today. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong button. Uh, it's to get used to the platform. So the first one was ancient and modern practices. And it was because the initial call for papers had such a big response, we split it into two events a year apart. The first one was uh, more theoretical aspects, as, as I said, and then the second one was the more practical aspects of contemporary issues dealing with citizenship. And of course, we do hope to have a third one, uh, uh, which will be future practices of citizenship in Asia and the West, which I'll mention at the end when we come back to the afterward I wrote, but also the last chapter of the eight in this book. So this is the table of contents. I won't go through this in detail because we'll go through each of the papers. Um, <clears throat> I wrote the introduction and a little afterward, which I always like to do, and then there's the eight papers. But before I, I jump into that, um, as uh, Anne Marie said, I would uh, introduce myself a little uh, because it's uh, kind of an odd <clears throat> mix of kind of Asian studies at IAS and spatial planning in uh, Delft. And uh, it came about because of just the odd trajectory my career took. I'm not actually a kind of career academic or a natural academic. I uh, like being an academic, but um, I initially trained as an architect in uh, Dublin, which is where I got my bachelor's. And uh, that was at the Dublin Institute of Technology. Uh, so it was a very technical education. Uh, and you got a Bachelor of Science degree from Trinity College, which was nice because it gave you the right to vote for the Senate. Uh, and we just had elections here in this country in the Netherlands. And I hope everybody who could vote went out and voted because it's a it's a sacred right and privilege, but it's also a duty that you have to inform yourself of the issues and then become actively engaged in them by um, you know, making your, your vote count on these issues. So I can't vote at all. That's why I'm kind of um, in an odd position as uh, thanks to the European Union, you can move around, but you don't have voting rights. So I do miss that because in Ireland, I can vote for the head of state because we don't have an hereditary monarch. We have a president who's elected. I can vote for the Senate because of my Trinity degree, and I can vote for the normal parliamentary body that most people can vote for. So I feel kind of somewhat disenfranchised, especially a week after an election, especially at such important times with issues like how do we deal with the coronavirus and so on. After I finished my bachelor's, I worked as an architect, first in Berlin, and then for three and a half years in Bangkok, and for, gosh, I don't know, about 11 years on and off in Singapore, working as an architect, but also working as a writer, an actual professional writer. I wrote a, a novel which uh, was a bestseller, and so I had to kind of deal with the publicity that went with that, which was very odd. And I also, in Singapore, wrote uh, architectural guidebooks. Of course, that work has dried up now, unfortunately, but hopefully it'll come back soon. Um, and then I decided I wanted to work as an architect in the Netherlands and did a master's in Delft, but was then invited to do a PhD, which I did in architecture theory, and then was invited to work. And I was delighted because I love the work of an academic. In a university, there's two major duties, as I see it. The first is short term. We need to educate the next generation of professional people 
in our disciplines. But the second is more important in societal terms. It's the medium to long term, whereby we have a group of people who are paid to think about the issues and reflect upon them and help move society and its discourses forward. So I'm very lucky with my job. It's part time, but uh, it's equally split between research and teaching. Um, and teaching is a very good way of testing your research because students are very good at keeping you on your toes. But the research is perhaps the most important thing that the university can do for society in the long term. And of course, all that research is no good unless you actually present it. So that's what today's presentation is about. It's a gathering and presentation of research by people at different levels, from different places, from different disciplines. And that's what I've always tried to do as editors of these books, is try to have a mix because you've got the younger minds who are you know, maybe more imaginative or bold in what they do, and the older minds who are well established and able to situate things well. And it's the combination of, of these that actually makes for a good collection of essays. And the job of the editor then is to unfold the story as best you can. So the first uh, paper is looking at uh, Shanghai and new residential habits. The next two papers are on Korea, another pair on India. There was a pair on Japan. Sadly, we had to lose one because of uh, copyright issues at the last moment. And then we have one on uh, the actual Western component, but it's Asians, uh, South Asians in America. And then we go back to Asia with uh, looking at Singapore. And the, then my afterward is about the right of the city. And that's the springboard into the next book, hopefully. Um, I'll begin by kind of in, recapping what I did in chapter one of volume one, which I actually had a chapter in. I don't have a chapter in this, just the introduction and afterward. Uh, but in chapter one, volume one, it was called Citizenship and the Good Life. And this shows, uh, it went back to uh, ancient Greece and ancient Rome and ancient China to look at the philosophers. And it's interesting to see how the things they were saying about society are still so valid today, which I'll come back to at the end uh, with reflexive modernity and, and, and Confucius. But Cicero was interested in examining citizenship. And he saw that the, the good citizen was a politically engaged one. Um, he advocated human agency, but understood that we never act alone. We are part of a community or society. Uh, when he was doing his thinking and writing, there was a field of thought called new academic skepticism, uh, new, uh, new academic uh, philosophy, which was very skeptical. And it a bit like postmodernism in the modern era in the late 20th century, this was kind of seen as if it could deny truth. It wasn't important uh, that you could say something was true. It was important where you could say uh, if it's true enough or if it is true at all or the relativity of the truth. And this is very postmodern where this was the era where the work of art was less important than what the critics said about it. This was, of course, the, the era also when you got white canvases or four minutes of silence. So you needed a critic to tell you how brilliant it was. If it was brilliant at all, we don't know. But um, Cicero didn't like this. He wanted to be practical. He was interested in seeing what can be said with confidence about society, about our places in it. And in this, he was very uh, reminiscent to, to my mind of what Foucault was saying about his critique of structuralism. And what made uh, Foucault's critique so um, impressive was because it was very concrete. He actually looked at theories of care of the self in the real world, in real spaces, in real time, so that they could be beneficial. His work, of course, was also grounded in the classical world. Now, Cicero's work as a philosopher, he's not in the first rank of philosophers. He was a sort of gatherer of other philosophies, but uh, he wasn't seeking new truths. He wasn't trying to be original. And in many ways, the same could be said of Confucius. He was sort of gathering received wisdom and presenting it in a way that made sense for the society in which he lived. So he and Cicero were busy trying to relate philosophy to current situations, which is also the task of this, these books, this series of books. Confucius and Cicero respected received wisdom, but they did not accept it uncritically. Confucius' philosophy placed humans at its center, but it wasn't abstract, it was practical, just like Cicero's. We need to practice our humanity. And any abdication of this agency of the practice of humanity curbs its power to affect change. And abdication can come in many guises, whether that's blind faith in systems, and they can be all kinds of systems. We'll see village morality in some of the Indian papers, but also religion, a blind faith in democracy, which is blind to its faults, uh, big data algorithms and so on, which we come to in the last paper. 
So the best thing you can do is look at another Western philosopher, Immanuel Kant, who said sapere aude, which translates literally as dare to know, but could be translated as dare to think for yourself. So whatever situation you're in, you must examine and critically examine to figure out what is the best thing to do. And this um, is hard to do. And that's why citizenship should be active. You should inform yourself of the issues that you're going to vote on, not just blindly vote, and but you should at least vote. Now, all of these papers in this book investigate issues related to the world's new urban turn. This could be seen as a second urban revolution. Uh, nearly 10,000 years ago, cities began to emerge. This saw a new form of social organization, which created things like new rules of living together, um, administrative rules, legal rules, uh, democracy to a certain extent, certainly then a high point in Greece two and a half thousand years ago, um, justice, civilization. These are all things that emerged in the early city in quite a mature form. And we still have them now nearly 10,000 years later, when the world is now more urban than than it has been at any time in our history as a species. In 2010, more than 50% of the world, is, since 2010, more than 50% of the world is urban. And that's the first time this has happened. Now, that's just a kind of a global statistic. There are parts of the world that haven't attained that milestone yet in parts of Africa. There's places like Europe that attained it in the mid 20th century. And this country, the Netherlands, actually attained it in the 17th century. So they've been a very urbane population for a very long time. So it's no wonder that they're so good at kind of spatial planning and designing of cities. <clears throat> An urbanizing world offers all kinds of opportunities um, and it should be, of course, an improving place, a place where people can flourish, where people can care for each other. And this care for each other begins, oddly, with the care of the self. The first paper is looking at the Western world as a utopia, but with a question mark. It examines Thames Town in Songjiang which is one of the um, one, town, uh, one city, nine towns plans around Shanghai for new kind of new towns, but that are following residential uh, uh, design patterns from the, the, the West, whether it's Italian or German or English. In Thames Town, as the name suggests, it's English. Martin Minos is a social and cult cultural anthropologist, and he's almost finished his PhD. He'll be defending it in July, I've just heard, at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris. Rich Chinese are moving into Western-inspired neighborhoods, places that look like this. It's hard to believe this is China. This has received criticism from commentators who see these as, uh, as imitations, as being fake, as a sort of theme park with statues of Churchill or Princess Diana or James Bond and the little red telephone boxes, which of course nobody uses anymore. Um, People see this as, as a kind of theme park. And this paper makes a detailed anthropological study of actual families living habits in some of the houses here. It questions our understanding of the Western concept of authenticity. It shows that residents are not experiencing any kind of acculturation process, and neither are they actually trying to imitate a Western way of life. They are generating new logics in managing their homes and families. Most critics of these developments have been architects and urbanists. Minost, as an anthropologist, has a different disciplinary perspective, and he examines not just the buildings themselves or the, the towns they're, they're built in, but how the spaces are actually lived in by the family. And this gives him interesting insights that the architects often miss. He shows that this hybrid spatial practice is a fascinating development in China's contemporary urban transformation, because we are beginning to see the emergence of a culture that is now confident enough to borrow from the West without being overwhelmed by it. This is particularly important in a city like Shanghai, which was a treaty port for 150 years. And it's interesting to see what happens in this century, the 21st century, as China is set to become in 2028, the world's largest economy. Uh, this is not um, unusual because China for most of history was one of the world's largest, if not the largest economy. So it's just kind of reverting to uh, the situation before the Western high point of colonialism, imperialism. I hope they'll be kinder to us than we were to them. But the next paper is How Does Space Have Meaning? A multifocal approach to the Korean Jim Jil Bang, which is a kind of bathhouse. Uh, Vera works as an employment advisor for refugees in Germany, and she helps facilitate their uh, capacity building. She also studied national and transnational studies, literature, culture, and language at Münster University. Here she is looking at the traditional Korean Jim Jil Bang, which kind of translates as a bathhouse, but it's not the sort of bathhouses we'd understand in 
Turkey or other part or the West. It's it's a very particular type of <laughs> social space, which is uh, nearly unique to Korea, but also sits in a wider Asian context. The various uh, author's background is in transnational studies, and this is located at the intersection of literary and cultural studies. The chapter's cross-cultural point of departure scrutinizes both global and local conceptualizations of space and attempts to sensitize how cultural meanings come into being and how particular narratives and performances are inherent in the creation of spatial experience. This transdisciplinary approach analyzes narrative and visual representations of space to show how meaning is produced. And she uses Bertrand Westphal's geocriticism, a concept that makes sure that space is placed at the center of this inquiry. It also means that place as space is continuously being made meaningful. That is the skill that anthropologists or social scientists have over designers like architects. Urbanists are uh, more attuned to society's needs because they do tend to see space as a place that comes into being through its use, through people over time, as something architects sometimes miss. Uh, so it's, uh, it's extremely important to understand that all spaces are built for people, not for the spaces themselves. They can be beautiful, but they are there to provide a function. And the beauty is a kind of side effect if, if they're well designed, but they should be functional. And it's this use of turning space into place that is um, extremely important for the discipline of urbanism and is also examined here, which also has the extra literary dimension because she's actually using the diaries of a uh, Korean adoptee who went back to, to visit her birth mother in Korea and came to this place, which was very alien to her as an American, as a Westerner. This is a methodologically new step in the field of studies, which has previously been determined by author and genre-centered approaches to space. And the outcome here in this chapter provides substantial material for future interdisciplinary research. The next chapter, <clears throat> is Transforming the Self in Contemporary Korean Ki Suryon, which is by Victoria Ten, who works as a lawyer at the Ministry of Justice in Israel and studied at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel, but also studied Korean philosophy in Seoul and did her PhD here in Leiden. Well, I'm in Khitorn, but most of some of you are in Leiden, at the Leiden University's Institute for Area Studies. Her paper examines practices of self-cultivation in contemporary Korea. Ki Suryon is mind-body cultivation, which uses Ki, life energy, like the Chinese Qi. Um, ki Chion is one type of Ki Suryon, and it is, what the author says, an alchemical practice of embodied knowledge. This is a theoretical framework based on Michel Foucault's Technologies of the Self, which we'll see in a moment in a different reading in Id India. Uh, and it's where uh, Victoria examines the visual iconography of the DVDs that actually advertise the Ki Chion, and with their particular focus on the elements of water, wood, and stone. She investigates how these elements are instrumental for the viewer's self-cultivation. And while this is actually a very literal interpretation of technologies of the self, it shows how Kisirian can be used to transform the self through these practices uh, about self-knowledge and self. And the, in, in the last year or so, with the lockdown and having to rethink our work, and those of us who could still work are very grateful for it, obviously, you do realize how important it is to take time for yourself, to focus, to, to realize what you want to do. And part of how I ended up doing what I do is just sometimes a happy accident of something coming along and being invited to do it and then doing it. But then this relates to an ancient Greek concept of, of kairos, which is being able to grasp what comes uh, and make use of it. And this is because of another Greek concept of nous, which is like common sense, but stronger than that, where you know what you need to do. But then in order to do that, you need to know yourself. And that was what was written over the entrance to the uh, cave of the Oracle at Delphi, where you would go in to hear these vague pronouncements. But if you knew yourself, you'd know what to do with them. So it's self-knowledge is incredibly important for the actual basis for the, the care of the self. And the care of the self is important because you can see yourself as an active part of a community. Therefore, you will be a better engaged with that community and less focused on your own individual rights because a focus on individual rights um, to the detriment of wider societal rights can da damage society and therefore damage the uh, structures on which the individual rights actually uh, depend. 
The next paper, we move to India. This is a relationship between architecture and ritual in the Hindu crematorium by Padipti Bekurti, who is an architect, has her own uh, DA studios in Hyderabad, and one of her designs for a Hindu crematorium won a major award in India. She also lectures in architecture, history and theory at architectural schools in India and studied histories and theories of architecture at the Architectural Association in London. Hindu philosophy sees um, death as a passing phase of life. In the cycle of uh, birth and death, death should be and has to be celebrated. Crematoria and cemeteries have oddly been largely ignored in Indian architectural treatises. And with India's recent and rapid urbanization, which has caused cities to sprawl, many crematoria now find themselves in an urban environment which is contrary to ritual requirements. Um, this paper explains the architectural variations in funerary spaces uh, with case studies of Hyderabad and Varanasi and shows how they've been influenced by religion, by the region in which they are built and by time. And it's an understanding of all three of these elements is needed if we are to see these ancient traditions and their architectural articulations to be passed on for future generations. Staying in India, New Bodies and Cities by Rachana Jori looks at contested technologies of the self and urban India. Her studies are in psychology, psychosocial studies and gender studies. Uh, she studied at the School of Human Studies in Ambedkar, University of Delhi, and also studied psychology at uh, the University of Delhi. Her work is located at the intersection of psychology, gender and culture. It effectively uses both real and cinematic narratives to argue that cities in India are characterized by highly contested physical spaces, bodily practices and technologies of the self. She very imaginatively uses real and uh, kind of imaginary examples. The first is the imaginary Syrat, which is a film, a cinematic portrayal of a murder, what is known sadly as an honor killing, which happened in Hyderabad, according to film. <clears throat> but Hyderabad is the same city where a bright young Dalit scholar named Rohit Vermula committed suicide after writing something which saw him suspended and that saw his funding being withdrawn. So he felt there was nothing else to do except take his own life. And uh, sadly, uh, a bright young mind was lost. We also hear in the same paper of the brutal gang rape of Jyoti Singh in Delhi on the 16th of December 2012. She sadly subsequently died of her injuries. Her crime was sitting on a bus after having gone to see a film with a man who was not her husband. India's urbanization has been in part fueled by rural urban migration, as has China's, as has indeed uh, the West in the industrial era. Cities are attractive to young people because cities are where you can go to reinvent yourself as well as have the opportunities that they afford. In the village, women, Dalits, uh, are fettered by caste and gender-based identities. Moving to the city should make it possible to reinvent yourself. And this paper shows real life and cinematic depictions of the violence that results when village mores follow people to the city, sometimes with tragic consequences, as we can see from this uh, thought-provoking and rather upsetting paper. Now we look at uh, family, everyday life and the making up of society, which is a case study of a particular family in Yokohama's Chinatown. This is by Wang Yi Lam Elim, who studied Japanese studies at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and also studied historical and anthropological training during her PhD studies. Maybe Amber can help uh, as we go to the little video. Okay, I think we can stop it because it's a longer clip. Super, thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. That's great. There's the tradition Chinese lion dance, which I used to see when I was in Singapore um, at Chinese New Year when the shop was opening or sometimes homes. And it's, a, it's an amazing art form, acrobatic and, and colorful. It's lovely. But um, this particular family that um, Wang Yilam Elim examines is uh, a family that came from Canton and moved to uh, Yokohama where they set up a restaurant and over three generations helped build up uh, a, an identity for the Chinese diaspora there, keeping Chinese cultural traditions alive. So this is where you can kind of pick what you want to take from your home place and help keep it, flourish it. And 
engaged in the new place that you've moved to without losing your identity of where you've come from. So it's a, a much happier example of taking something from where you've been before. Um, and one of the key components that allows this to happen is the Chinese understanding of jia, which translates into English as house, home, family. And we, we, can trans we can separate those functions in the West, but in China you can't. The house is the home, it's where the family is. And it's that very important understanding of the home is the living space of the family that helps give these people their uh, sense of belonging as a particular unit wherever they happen to be. And so this is a case study of this particular family, the Xie family, with uh, exhaustive interviews, which sees the connections between family and everyday life and the making up of this particular overseas Chinese community in Yokohama. Sadly, we lost the paper that was dealing with homeless people, uh, uh, particularly Korean immigrants, North Korean immigrants in Japan. But um, if you're interested, I can give you a link to it, which was published elsewhere. Next is, um, we go to the West, to America, where we look at mental health scenario of Asian Americans. This is by two people who work at the Department of Social Work at the University of Rio Grande Valley, Texas. That's Sushila Bai Sunivasa and Surasham Pasupaleti. Their paper highlights problems that come with migration. This is a group that's usually thought of as very successful in America, Asian Americans, in this case, South Asian Americans. The paper examines mental health and South Asians' reluctance to use mental health services that are there for them. This is a group that has actually received scant attention in policy and program focus. So this paper shines a very useful light on this knowledge gap and the disproportionate lack of utilization of mental health services that Asian Americans have, South Asian Americans have, is due to their feelings of shame, which is a throwback to their countries of origin. This chapter raises vital questions about these groups, this group's needs, particularly their underreporting of mental health issues. It also includes a helpful look at the social and environmental factors that affect this underreporting and under underutilization. It also sends a warning: unless something is done about this issue, it may mean problems for what has been until now considered very much a model minority. Care of the self, discipline in smart cities, centres in Singapore, is by Joost Alblas and Stephen Dorostein. This examines Singapore, which is seen as a front runner in the developing of the use of urban centers to control movement, access, and interaction in society. Doris Dane has a background in the ethics of technology, and Oliblas has a background in design and philosophy of technology. This gives them unique insights into what is going on in this futuristic global city. The paper is grounded in an astute reading of Michel Foucault's Care of the Self, and his surveillance theories. It asks if current trends in urbanism, particularly smart cities, have created a tension between discipline and self-care. What is the meaning of the care of the self in a sensor society such as Singapore, where discipline and control seem to come first, where passes, chips, and biometric data determine who moves where in the city? This thought-provoking critique of sensor society acknowledges both disciplinary tendencies and also, fortunately, emerging forms of self-care resistance. To surveillance. And then the very last uh, paper is a very brief afterward, which uh, picks up the strands of the arguments in censor chapter, the last chapter in the book, uh, to address the right to the city. And this will be the point of departure for the next volume, hopefully. So the question is, what role does human agency have in the city? Um, and this question is a vital one. Whether it's uh, sensors uh, or even algorithms that determine where you can and cannot go, whether it's automation that is rendering whole swathes of populations unemployed and unemployable, and therefore this is the duty of the government to step in and help re-educate them, upskill them so that they can be a useful part of society, because if they don't, they fall outside the safety net and become homeless. And then the middle class gets squeezed and smaller and smaller, so the tax base becomes smaller, so that there isn't enough money to provide the things that we need to provide in a civilized society, like education, healthcare, care for the elderly, and so on. And if things are going wrong, we need to protest. We have a right to uh, air our voices, and uh, whether that's through the democratic fora that we have in some countries or other means, it is an important human right. And this shows whether you go out to vote or whether you go out to protest that, you know, to be an active citizen does require engagement. But the problem is, what if this is denied? And worse, what if we don't know why it's being denied? What role have we 
or the state or NGOs in the face of powerful transnational corporations or the increasing surveillance capitalism and increasing market fundamentalism where everything is based on profit and anything that isn't profitable is pushed aside. Uh, and in a society, particularly now, where small elites are growing richer and richer and the middle class is squeezed and many rely on these kind of Mac jobs or zero hour contracts, who gets to decide on these things anymore? Uh, well, we do, or we should do, not algorithms. But now more than ever, we need agency in society in order to make sure that we keep it going in the right direction. And these are some of the questions that will be explored in the next volume. This is obviously this volume, but hopefully future practices of citizenship in Asia and the West will round out this trilogy of uh, interrogations of concepts of citizenship and comparisons East and West, which has been very useful and will be increasingly important as Asia becomes increasingly important. This will be explored at a, at a round table at the ICAS conference in Kyoto in August. That We don't know if that's going to happen, but hopefully it, it at least will happen online. And I'm currently working with IAS and, and Ukna and Paul Rebe. Hopefully we will be able to organize a seminar on this, a two-day event, a symposium, that will actually then be the place where we get the papers for the book. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much.